comments when I heard several lies and several fabrications of that day and about my son, which I knew they didn't know him. I knew I had to be his voice and I had to speak up for him. Leslie McSpadden is the mother of Michael Brown. On August 9, 2014, her son was shot and killed by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. Brown was African-American, 18 and unarmed. Wilson, who was white, stopped Brown because he fit the description of a suspect involved in a store theft. There were words, a scuffle, and then the shooting. Officer Wilson said he shot Brown, who was six feet five and nearly 300 pounds, in self-defense because he feared for his life. The shooting sparked protests and rioting and became a catalyst in the Black Lives Matter movement. Hands up, what, what, don't what, shoot. What were you, is that all you were saying? That's all we were saying. Hands up, don't shoot. Were you in the front line up there? In the front line, yes. And they just started shooting. Racial tensions increased in Ferguson and elsewhere in the nation as Officer Wilson was cleared of any wrongdoing in the controversial shooting by a grand jury and also a Department of Justice investigation. Darren Wilson is no longer a police officer. Leslie McSpadden continues to grieve for her son. On a visit to Seattle University, she sat down with me before a group of students for a personal and at times emotional interview. She has written a book titled Tell the Truth and Shame the Devil, The Life, Legacy, and Love of My Son, Michael Brown. The book chronicles her life, her son, the shooting, her efforts to keep her son's memory alive and to find justice in Ferguson and the nation. What is the meaning behind the, the title of your book, To Tell the Truth and Shame the Devil? It means exactly what it says. When you tell the truth, you do shame the devil. Um, the devil is built up on lies and evil thoughts. My grandmother used to say that saying to us all the time when she thought we were lying, you know. <laughs> and um, there were a few devils that crossed my path through my lifetime. And that happened to be one that crossed my son's path on August 9th. And um, with telling his story and my story, I wanted to shame all the devils and be completely honest, because I have no secrets about anything. Writing this book, for you, is it important so that people understand who you are, where you came from, but also about your son? Yes, it was important for everybody to know about Michael's life before August 9th. I wanted them to know how he lived, where he came from, his personality, his characteristics, and also his struggle with some of his health issues and his learning issues, and that he did try and he did per persevere through a lot of those things. And in your life as well? In my life as well. But throughout my life, I did not want my kids to see my weaknesses, only my strengths. And um, Michael's death has made me weak and strong at the same time. And I needed to let the world know how, how I also persevered through some of my trials and some of the devils that crossed my path mm -hmm. while raising Michael. What were some of those trials and devils? Well, the first one were, um, was um, the domestic violence that I witnessed at a young age and didn't fully understand what love was or how I wanted to be loved. Um, just being vulnerable, lonely, young, and not knowing a lot of what I know now. And um, a lot of self-taught lessons. In writing the book as well, uh, you really wanted people to know about Michael. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Michael. Michael was uh, my first child, and he was uh, a dog lover. He was very artistic. He was a big brother. He was the first grandchild. So he was loved all the way around. And it's so ironic that it was 
so many people at the hospital when I had Michael. It was like a celebration. And when he died, there was once again so many people around. And I find that ironic that he was celebrated on both ends. What did he like to do? Oh, wow. He was very quiet and preserved. And he started out being a gamer. He loved games. He mastered Sonic at three years old, Sonic Hedgehog. <laughs> and from there it went, it, well first it started with movies, Disney movies, and then um, he would sit in his high chair and eat his cereal. He would feed himself, no feeding him, he's just in the high chair and he's watching Lion King and any Disney movie, his grandmother, he was the first grand boy, not her first grandchild, but grandson. So everybody just doted and loved Michael. And um, it went from the videos to the games to computers, which was his last adventure that he was mastering. And that was um, how his friends kind of flocked around him because he was like the producer. And he knew how to work the computer very well. And um, Michael's potential would take him to college. And he wanted to mimic his father in a way and do the HVAC program, which was working with wires and um, home cooling systems and things like that. But once he mastered it, he was going to move on. That's the type of kid he was. That's the type of person he was. And by him being so quiet, you never would know all the things that he knew. So people would gather around him and, and try to learn from him. But Michael was a brilliant, bright, smart kid. Was he uh, the type of kid that liked to tear something apart and try to put it Take back it together? Take it apart and put it back together. Yeah. And I emphasize on that in the book. That was the first time I knew that he was going to be this secret genius. So in school, he had two different things. He struggled in one area, but he was like a brilliant genius in the other area. So the area he struggled in was a written expression, meaning that um, he, he needed to do open book tests. And everybody learns differently. And that was his different way of learning. He had a problem with recalling what he read maybe in the beginning of the book. So he did have an IEP and was in special school district for the last two um, college, not college, I'm sorry, high school years of school. When did you discover that along the way? It started in second grade and they tried to say that he had ADHD. But um, what second grader fully pays attention and is like this at the <laughs> board the whole time. So I wanted, I wasn't okay with that. I didn't agree to it. It was not a thing from a doctor. It was the counselor at school. So my thing was to put him somewhere separate and teach him in the way that he knows how, well, how he learns, because everyone learns different. And from that point on, we never had any more problems with ADHD even being brought up and Michael just excelled from there. Was he a mama's boy? He was a mama's boy, a daddy's boy, a granny's boy. He was more of a granny's baby. Um, he was my mother's first grandchild. And like I said, he was Miss Brown's first grandson. And I was 16 having a baby. So having those people in my life at that moment was very important and I'm appreciative and I thank them because I had to learn how to be a mother, you know. I was still a kid myself. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Very young. Yes. What were those trials and tribulations like, those challenges of being a young mom? It was compromising and sacrifices because I was still in school. I wanted to graduate and that would have been um, something that I wanted to do for me and also for him. But times got trying. My mother was a single parent, so I had to drop out of school and get a job and take care of my son. And at 18, when he graduated, our plans was for me to go back to school. And our plans were interrupted. But I want to say now I am in school and I am working towards getting my diploma. That's great. Mm -hmm. So the two of you, did you uh, kind of talk and plan and scheme together about the future? <laughs> well, he was like the man of my house, you know? and. Um, it was more of him growing up and me maturing. And um, I had my second baby at 19. And um, he was a great big brother. They went to the same school, they slept in the same room, and I was teaching Michael responsibility. 
not only as a big brother, but as a young man. So we had a lot of plans, but I've learned to not even make plans because God already has plans for me. Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Ferguson, Missouri. Well, first I want to say that Ferguson is a small part of St. Louis. It's St. Louis, Missouri. It's split into two, St. Louis City and County. And um, I don't know much about Ferguson. I've never lived in Ferguson. I never really visited Ferguson. Where my mother lives is just a piece, it's just a, a road of Ferguson that comes off of West Florissant. Most people would say that that's a sundown town, meaning that you don't ride over there with more than one other person in the car. You don't ride over there while this, it's nighttime if you're a black person. You don't go over there if you happen to be, if you have one headlight and it may have just went out, saying that the police will particularly do, you know, mess with you if you're a black person once you cross over into Ferguson. So I never went to Ferguson, and I don't know much about Ferguson, but what I've learned since my son was killed was that this is a pattern of Ferguson, and it's a practice of their police department. And we're seeing them put more black faces into the police department, but will they necessarily change the pattern of Ferguson? I don't think it will. Michael was a good-sized guy. He was, he was big. Mm -hmm. And um, did he get hassled by police? No. My son never had an encounter with the police officer. And where he went to school um, is Normandy, and they keep a large police presence. It's such a big school, and it has so many different um, neighborhoods and communities that go to that one school that they usually have a lot of fights. My son has never had a fight. In, in grade school, two kids tried to, and I'll talk about it in the book, it's kind of funny that um, he had a fight in grade school and two kids did pick on him for his age, I mean his height, his weight, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And he had this little squeaky voice, but he was heavy and they, um, they were messing with him and I remember they called me and they said, Michael had a fight and I, it was two boys and I was so scared when I got there and I was frantic and I was running looking for him and when I got to the office, he was eating lunch so casually like, hey mom. <laughs> and I was like, you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. And one little boy's braid was kind of pulled up and the other his shirt was a little ripped. <laughs> and I was like, but well, what? And, and so he got past that. You know, we talked about it. We talked to the kids and it was almost like a bullying situation because Michael was heavy, but he had this light voice. So they thought, oh, he is. But in high school, he never had a problem. In middle school, he never had a problem. Did his voice change? It did. And deeper. I would love to hear it right now. Yeah. Was it deeper? It was deeper. Deeper. And he was much taller than me at this point, you know, so I would have to look up at him and <laughs> he would look down at me, but he was growing a little beard and all those things. He never had a job. He never knew how to drive, but he was learning. He was on his way to becoming a man. He was still a little kid to me. This writing of the book, mm -hmm. this getting out in front of people like you are here mm -hmm. today, and you will be speaking to a bigger group of people this evening. Mm -hmm. What is this doing for you? How is it helping you? Is it? Um, I don't know if it helps me, but I hope people walk away with a better understanding of what type of young lady I was and what type of woman I grew into. Um, the way that I raised Michael. Um, and I want to draw them into the book and kind of put them in that place where they can hear my voice and they can see what was going on around me. And um, I just want them to have a better understanding and just know that everything you see in the media and what you see on TV is not necessarily true and that those people were um, saying things and making up stories and they knew nothing about me or Michael, nothing. So it's your chance to clarify things, to let people I hope so. know. I want it to be. I want to go back to the day that you got the phone call, August 2014. Mm -hmm. You were working. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you immediately went to the scene. Yep. And you weren't able really to see him, at least immediately. I didn't see him at all. I didn't see him for two weeks. For two weeks. And um, what they told me was that, well, you don't want to see him. But I want to see him. And um, they didn't let me see him. They didn't let me um, identify him at the site. They didn't let me come to the morgue. I saw my son in a private, um, what are you, awake. And at that moment, he was pretty much looking like Michael, but I could tell where he was hurt. Why wouldn't they let you see him? I don't know. I don't know. In the wake of that, you know, there were protests, there were riots. Uh, Ferguson became um, really the uh, a focus of the issue of uh, police and the conflicts with communities of color. Mm -hmm. And it also really propelled the Black Lives Matter movement and through all of this. As all this was going on, how are you trying to keep it together? I was uh, not looking at social media, not watching the news. I was kind of secluded, just in my room. And I'm going to be honest, when I heard several lies and several fabrications of that day, and about my son, which I knew they didn't know him. I knew I had to be his voice. And I had to speak up for him, for the son I raised and the person that I knew, to say that these things can't be true. Such as, what were the things that bothered you the most? Oh God, the video from the store bothered me the most. Because they weren't being honest about the relationships that corner store owners have with people in those communities. They weren't honest about what may have happened the day before, which they do have a video of. The governor was not honest about taking the prosecutor off the case, knowing his history and his feelings towards black people in Missouri. Everything was a fabrication. Everything became a cover-up for this one person. For the police officer? Yes. Darren Wolf? Yes. Yes. But you don't like talking about it at all? I don't. But I will. What are you hoping, I guess, down the line? He, he's no longer with the force. Um, he didn't get charged in any way. But yet there's still you know, a, a lawsuit pending that, are, that you, your family has brought against Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, are you hoping that some action then eventually will be taken against him as well as the city? Really with him? Um, he needs to be held accountable for his actions as a person and his actions as an officer. And um, the mayor of Ferguson, the chief of Ferguson, any of our elected officials that are helping to cover this up for him, they all should be held accountable because that's that's why we saw the rioting. That's why, because once again, people were being let down by the system in Missouri. And it had happened to so many people before my son, but I wasn't a part of that world. And I didn't know. When we turn on the news, it just lets us know it's been two, three, four shootings and someone is dead, but you never know who that person is, who their family is, and what journey they're about to go through. And there were so many moms to come up and tell me what they knew was going to happen. But I said, how can they not? This happened in the middle of the day. And there were so many people out here to see what happened. Over 60 witnesses. 
and they did not take their testimony. They used the person that wasn't even there, and then Darren Wilson himself. In the lawsuit that the family has brought, it, uh, are you looking to get to what you think needs to be told about what happened that day yes. and, and the truth behind yes. it all? that's the truth. All the evidence needs to be displayed and the truth should be told, but when the evidence is displayed, I think the truth will be told. And with that, it will show the DOJ findings that we were never you know, displayed to the world also the state findings that were never displayed to the world and how the prosecutor did not treat my son equally as he should have. You alluded to the fact that there have been changes in, in Ferguson uh, since Michael's shooting. Department of Justice report led to changes in the police department. The city now has its first black police chief. There's an emphasis on community policing and the use of body cameras. Are you satisfied with those changes? I think it's a start, but I'm not satisfied. There's much more to do. And I think the start should have been with changing the laws to protect people like Michael and other black and brown boys in St. Louis, all over the world. Because we see more laws in place for the police who are the law than in place for society as the people. Why is that? Two years ago, they said they would change the training, they would add de-escalation, that they would do a number of things. And since Michael has been killed, we've seen several more people be killed by the police. And we keep hearing the same story. We see them take the family through the same thing, and the result is always the same. No indictment, no prosecution. What are we supposed to do? I asked for mental health. They won't provide that. We've asked for a number of things, and they have nothing to offer the families. You want the families to have mental health it's care important. after this? This is traumatic, very much so, especially when you see your loved one laying face down on the ground with blood coming out the top of his head. and somebody's standing over him with a gun, not trying to help him. They never tried to help him. They never tried to help him. Why? Why does Aaron Wilson get to go on with his life and get married, have a baby, and act like he didn't just kill my son. And I haven't been given one factual reason why. These young people that are here today, they represent the, the next generation. What do you want them to, uh, what do you want them to do? That's a good question. We all want to know what can we do. And starting with myself, I'm still trying to figure that out. But I think we could love each other a little more, a lot more, and start valuing life itself in any form that it is. And look past the uniform that people wear and know that everybody's capable of having a bad day. Everybody's capable of making a mistake. But you have to own up to it. You have to be responsible for what you do. And we see a lack of responsibility when it comes to some law enforcement being held accountable for their actions as a person being in whatever mental state of mind they happen to be in at that moment. And we don't, we're not seeing that at all. Do you think there are efforts underway though, being done? Here in Seattle, the police department is under a consent, consent degree under the Justice Department for its use of force. 
Um, you know, there is still, you know, the jury's out as to just how much change and progress we're making. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, according to a monitor, we are making progress. Do you think? Really? You well, think they that have the same monitor in Ferguson. And they've read it recently, and the findings were still the same, that they still target black people and give them tickets, large fines. So does that work? Does a monitor work? No, I don't think it works in Rike. You have to make, they have to make an example out of somebody. And why not start with Darren Wilson? And the training? We've heard so much on the training, but we've not seen, we haven't seen it in black and white, should I say. And I know that sometimes black and white stands out to everybody, meaning that this is written, it's, it's, it has a seal on it, it has to happen. But we haven't seen that, and we're continuing to hear de-escalation, policy reform, but we're not seeing those things happen, but we are still seeing these deaths and these families go through what they go through. You've had some opportunities to speak before the nation. You spoke at the Democratic National Convention. You I also, did. You did. You also um, appeared in a Beyonce video mm -hmm. as well, along with some of the other moms. Those opportunities, um, what did they mean to you, but also, are they helping you in the healing process? The DNC, um, I met Hillary months before that in Chicago. And um, she came to us as a mother, a woman, a grandmother. And we didn't have to say anything. She knew who we were. She knew about our situations. She knew about our sons and our daughters. And her concern was just as ours. What are we going to do? What do we see happen? How do we make change? How do we hold these people accountable for the action? And for me, that said that she gets it. And with Beyonce and her mother, it was just the same. And not because they're black, but they understand. And they get it. And it's not a thing about being a celebrity or having a lot of money. It's about having an open heart. And she showed me that each time she invited me out. It was like cousins, like family. It wasn't um, her big ego or anything. It was just her as a person. Is there a bond you have with the other moms? Of course. We have a bond. We may be in different places at different times, but we always meet in the middle. We talk often. We have um, groups that we're in that we, you know, do Texas and different things like that. Um, some people work for the senseless gun violence, and some moms talk about police brutality. But I think it coexists. It all goes together because these are senseless killings that we're seeing from police. Some police. Do you feel like you're making a difference in getting out and speaking? and um, telling your story? I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. But within my situation, I don't see any change. So it leaves me wondering, am I? I don't know. Any last thing that you want to say to them? Oh, wow. Just just don't give up on anything. This is another room of hope for me. Just don't give up. That's all. Thank you. That's strong. I'm trying. This helps with that part. Mm -hmm. It helps with that part. Does it? It does. Yeah. 
because if people show up just to hear you, you know, just to see you, it gives you a little more support. I just hope it gets better. And um, it doesn't have to happen directly to you. If you're living in these days, it's happening around you. So you should be vocal too. No one should want to live in a world like this. This is it what the flag stands for. It really is. And I was taught to say the Pledge of Allegiance in grade school. And now I'm learning that they really didn't. It wasn't for me. But why? Why not? I was proud to put the flag on the pole. But I didn't have a full understanding. But now I do. You still feel proud? I still feel proud, but there are some changes that has to be made, and um, I'll keep doing these things until I see the change, full circle, not half of a circle. Yeah, and I think people in this room can help with it, because this is our future, and they will be those voices for the future. All of them. Even mine. They're young, but they're growing. And Michael's too. Yeah. We hope so. So hope is our big word. You know, and keep your faith. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. No problem. Thank you.